And good morning, everybody, and welcome on this May 30th, Memorial Day weekend, as uh, we have just got done with worship a few minutes ago and celebrating our graduating seniors. And now it's time for another session of Sunday School as we continue our topical study on forgiveness, finding peace through letting go is the title of it. And it's a study by our good friend, Adam Hamilton, pastor of Church of the Resurrection down in Leewood, Kansas, a south suburb there of Kansas City, largest United Methodist Church in the world. And uh, it's been a good study, and uh, I don't think I'll be able to wrap it up today. It'll probably be next Sunday. Uh, we'll be able to put the bow on top of the gift, get it all gift-wrapped and ready to rock and roll. Um, today, though, we want to talk about what is referred to as the biblical process of reconciliation, because reconciliation is always the goal of forgiveness and going through the whole process. So just so you know that. Now, when you look at Matthew chapter 18, uh, where is where we're going to be spending some of our time today, Jesus knew, he knew because he knows everything, but because he knows and understands human nature, this new thing that he was creating, you know, that he was birthing, the church, because it consists of people, he knew that there would be conflict. Conflict in the church? Oh, my goodness, how does that happen? Yeah, unfortunately, it does happen. Uh, as I am becoming more and more of a senior statesman in the annual conference, I'm and become privy more to more and more things uh, that go around, I'm finding out that Conflict within the church is more the norm and not the exception to the rule. And uh, it happens for a lot of different reasons. But it, it happens because of people. People are people. We're going to have differences. Uh, we're going to misunderstand one another, miscommunicate. And so knowing that this was going to be the case, Jesus gives us some advice as to how Christians within the church are to be reconciled to one another. Now, he speaks about this in two different places. He talks about it in Matthew chapter 5, which is uh, a part of the Sermon on the Mount. And let's just uh, look at that real quick. And uh, 23 and 24, verses 5, Matthew 5, um, Jesus says, So when you are offering your gift at the altar... If you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and sister, and then come and offer your gift. Now, that's what Jesus says about the whole idea of forgiveness. Um, it's an important thing. Now, um, let me just uh, get my pages right here. Here we go. And because uh, i got to read another scripture here for a minute. You need to understand something. The altar that Jesus is referring to there, if you're at the altar getting ready to offer your gift, and you recall this, the altar that he's referring to, remember the Jews could only do uh, their pro forma worship, the real deal worship happened in Jerusalem in the temple. So the altar that Jesus is referring to here is the altar in Jerusalem. So he says, after you, when you are in the process of doing all of this, you're getting ready. You're just not quite there yet. And when Jesus is saying this in Matthew 5, where is he? He's in Galilee, which is to the north, the northern part of Israel. And the altar he's referring to that he's talking about there is a 10-day trip by foot, which is how most people would travel to get there. So he's saying there, if you realize as you are getting ready to offer this gift in Jerusalem, that you have forgotten to ask forgiveness of someone you have wronged back home here in Galilee, go home make amends in Galilee before you make your sacrifice to God in Jerusalem. Oh, 
Why? Now, that's how the people of his day would have understood that, okay? It's important that you always put things within their context and understand them as the people who are hearing them for the first time would understand them. Now, more to that point, I think here, as well as many other places, Jesus is using hyperbole, but and that is exaggerated speech, uh, and he's you know he's trying to make a point by using exaggerated speech. For example, when he was talking about cut off your hand, pluck out your eye, if they offend you, he did not mean that that's what you were supposed to do. That you're supposed to go physically mutilate yourself. Um, He's just using exaggerated speech to make an important point. The point here is that a right relationship with God requires a right relationship with your neighbors and your friends and your family, the people that you know. Right relationship with God means right relationship with the people in your life. Okay? Don't talk to me about your piety don't talk to me about your, how, you, how you've grown in your Christian life if you've got people in your life that you have not forgiven or who have not forgiven you because you have not gone and asked. Okay, it's as simple as that. Now that may sound a little growly bear, but truth is, truth is. Okay, so part of your Christian discipleship is getting right with your neighbors, making amend with your neighbors. And when you do when we are the one that is doing the wronging here, when we are the ones that have offended somebody else, Jesus is saying, it is up to us to take the initiative. Okay? If you know you've done something wrong to somebody, it is up to you to take the initiative. And that not nagging little voice in the back of your head that keeps reminding you of that is the Holy Spirit. You know, Jiminy Cricket said, let your conscience be your guide. Well, for the Christian, your conscience is the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, the, and guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. You aren't going to get rid of it until you take care of that whole situation. So, in uh, Matthew 18, this is what Jesus says now. Now, we, we were talking there about if you committed the sin. Okay, now, if someone sins against you, let's put the shoe on the other foot. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender then refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Okay? Now, that seems pretty straightforward, I know. Now, what Jesus, Jesus is talking here to a fairly small group, comparatively small group. The church really, it consists, doesn't really even exist yet. It's going to be birthed on the day of Pentecost. So he's talking there to his disciples. And so he might be talking to a couple hundred people at best. But what he's saying there is that when an offender does not see or acknowledge what they have done to you, then you are to go and talk to them privately. Now, there are two parts to this. Do not wait for the other person. Well, maybe they'll come around and they'll come see me and they'll, and they'll come talk. You know, I'll, I'll wait on them. No. Jesus says, take the initiative. Um, and secondly, he says, do not tell your friends about it. Do not tell anybody about it. Do this privately. Now, often when somebody does something to us, offends us, what's the first thing that we do? 
well, we'll, we're going to tell everybody. We'll tell our, our buddies, our friends, our coffee partners, you know, anybody and everybody. You know that so-and-so, that nasty so-and-so did to me? And we will spout off about it. Um, and even worse, we'll go out to these days, we put it on social media, you know, so that whoever's following us, and that could be anybody, is also going to know what's been done here. So we'll, we'll talk to anybody that'll listen, but we won't go to the person who's intimately involved here. And not only does that make the reconciliation harder, because word eventually gets back around, but we now have sinned against the other person because we haven't followed Jesus' injunction of going and doing this pro privately. So now we're wrong too. So now you've complicated the situation who knows how many times over. So number one, go to the person. Go to the person privately. Tell them honestly, without condemnation, without trying to uh, guilt them or anything else, but say you did this and it bothers me, it offended me, it hurt me, you hurt me. By doing so, Jesus says, you may regain that friend, that person who has wronged you. Um, your relationship may be able to be restored. Now, that is step one of the biblical means of reconciliation. And this is the way that the church is supposed to do it. Now, Jesus offers step two and step three here as well, because oftentimes the first step is not going to work. Unless the person, you know, is, a, you know, a real good friend or something, and even good friends may say, you know, what? You know, what are you talking about? I didn't mean it that way. You misunderstood me. No, um, I'm not going to own up to this. Okay. Jesus says, okay, they don't listen to you. They don't accept responsibility. They don't ask for forgiveness. They don't apologize or whatever the case may be. They keep on doing whatever it is they're doing. You take two or three witnesses, trusted witnesses, friends, um, but, you know, trusted friends, people who know how to keep their mouths shut. And you, again, go to the person that has sinned against you. Now, the witness's job is to listen, to listen carefully. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we don't listen carefully. Their job is to listen carefully to what is said and to watch in terms of what is done. They are to bear witness to the wrong that has been committed, and their role is to help bring reconciliation. Reconciliation is always the goal, okay? We don't always get there, but that's always the goal. That's the reason why we're doing this. So you go with two or three witnesses, you confront the person again, and when I say confront, I don't mean confrontational. I don't mean get in your face or anything like that. I mean uh, you're presenting the evidence, and here you go. Now, okay, I've got these two or three people with me as witnesses, and I'm saying to you, you did this to me. It offended me. It hurt me. You know, and I, I really think you need to apologize. I really want us to make this right, and it needs to start with an apology from you and a change of action from you. Okay. They refuse. They persist in whatever the action is supposed to be. And so, what do you do now? Well, in Jesus' thinking, and in that day, he might have been referring to a group of 12, 20 people is what would make up the church at that point in time. But you are to appeal to the entire church. Um, and you are to make your case to the church. Again, not on Facebook uh, or TikTok or any other place. You are to appeal to the church, make your case, and call upon the person to repent and be reconciled. If the church agrees with you, then they are also to call upon the church, the person, to repent and be reconciled. 
Now, what happens next is interesting. If they refuse to listen to the church, what do you do? Jesus says, you are to treat them as a tax collector and a Gentile. Now, this whole process is sometimes referred to as church discipline. You don't hear about that an awful lot these days uh, because we tend to ignore things or hope they'll go away or think that, well, I really don't have any legal grounds to go, you know, to go to that person or who am I to judge or whatever the case may be. But this is church discipline. Jesus says, treat them as a tax collector or a Gentile. Now, some people think that that means ignore them excommunicate them, kick them out of the church. And believe you me, there have some people, been some people over the years, I wanted to do that too. And in fact, my dear blessed loving wife has even had a person or so that she wanted to do it too as well. Um, you just, you get to a point where you see that behavior is destructive. It's just not helping the church. And if they won't listen, if they won't change, you feel like, I got to do something here. But, so I was one of those people at, at, for a long time thought that what Jesus was saying here was excommunicate them. And there have been people I wanted to excommunicate. But I don't think that's what this is talking about anymore. Because, what, think about it. What was one of the accusations that was leveled at Jesus by the Pharisees and the priests and, and the high priests? One of the accusations was that he hung out with sinners. Prostitutes he ate with tax collectors, Samaritans, the those people, those unclean people. He hung out with them. He appealed to them. He loved them. And so, if you're going to, if people are, that sin against you, refuse to hear the admonition of the church, treat them as a Gentile or a tax collector, I think that means Jesus is saying, continue to reach out to them, continue to love them, continue to try and draw them to Christ. You know, they will know we are Christians by our love. Love them. Don't shun them. Um, the Amish have a practice, I believe it's the Amish, maybe it's the Mennonites, called shunning when somebody is uh, supposed to be in error somehow, some way, in terms of things of the faith or lifestyle, and they shun them. Um, the community, their community of faith is closed to them, which becomes extremely difficult for them. Um, we are not to do that. that. I don't believe that Jesus is talking here about excommunication. Um, forgive them anyway. You're trying, you know, by the process of biblical discipline here, what you're trying to do is to win them over, uh, to help them to see their sin and get them to repent and be reconciled. Forgive them anyway, then. Offer forgiveness. Love them. Try to draw them to Christ. So, the whole idea here now of forgiving, offering forgiveness, and being forgiven are part of the dynamic of the growing process of Christian discipleship. If you are a true Christian disciple, you are seeking to forgive, and you are seeking to be forgiven. Assuming that there, you know, there are areas in your life where that needs to happen. Okay, now, we're still talking here about small to medium-sized stones in your backpack. What about the really big ones? The, real, the boulders, the big, devastating stones. Well, number one, you cannot do this alone, okay? Right off the bat, you can't do this alone. You have to go to God, and you have, you have to ask for help. You have to ask for grace. You have to ask for mercy. 
and understanding and wisdom, discernment as to how you're going to deal with this situation. You need to pray. You need to pray for your own healing, number one. And you need to pray for the person who has committed the offense against you. Uh, and that's always a good question to ask yourself. The person who has really grievously sinned against me, have you prayed for them? Have you lifted them up in prayer? Because if somebody does something against you, I mean, it's one of the first things you're, you're going to be angry. Uh, you might even start hating on them. It's hard to hate somebody when you're praying for them. Uh, even if you're praying an imprecatory prayer, you know, the prayers of condemnation uh, on them. You know, when you're praying for somebody, it's hard. It's hard to stay angry with them. Um, realize also that this process of forgiveness is not going to happen overnight. It will not happen overnight. This is going to be a process um, that may lead you into areas you may never have thought. It may lead you to take action on things you may, have, may never thought of that thought were possible. But you may end up doing things in order to be able to uh, work out your pain and your grief. But you have to be open to whatever road God leads you down on this particular thing. And oftentimes, these boulders, you, you can't blast them with dynamite, okay? They're going to have to be chipped away, just like a sculptor. Uh, Michelangelo was looking at the big block of granite that would, uh, marble, excuse me, that would eventually become his masterpiece, David. And somebody said, why are you looking at it? What do you see? He said, I see David, and I'm going to set him free. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to chip away every piece of marble that doesn't look like David. Well, that sounds pretty simple, but that's basically what it takes. Um, you look at the faces on Mount Rushmore or the great uh, sculptor of Crazy Horse that's being blasted also out of the side of a mountain. Uh, how did that happen? Overnight? No, it took years and years and intense work and study in terms of figuring out where to blast, where to chip, uh, where to do this, where to do that. When somebody has really done something serious, it takes time. I'm sorry. I wish I could offer you a quick, easy remedy, but they 99.99% .99 of the time, they don't exist. They don't happen. You know, all of us, all of us, I can say this without fear of contradiction, all of us have hurt other people. And all of us have been hurt. And probably all of us have been hurt badly by someone else or someone else's. And you may still be carrying that stone and maybe other stones like it around with you. And you need to ask for forgiveness. You need to offer forgiveness. You need to pray for strength and courage to be able to deal with it. Um, even if the other person doesn't forgive you, you ask for forgiveness, you confess, you repent, you know, you rap, you pray, and you ask for forgiveness, you admit your sin, you say you're sorry. Even if they do not forgive you, maybe they say something like, I, I, I will never forgive you for what you did or what you said. Um, and that happens. You have done, you have, you have fulfilled your responsibility, okay, by asking for forgiveness, by repenting for apolo and apologizing. You have put the ball in the other court. Now it's up to the other person to do whatever it is that they're going to do. And if they choose not to forgive you, it could be for a lot of reasons, most of them not good. Um, maybe they need to work through their pain and their grief a little bit. Maybe they want to manipulate you. Um, 
whatever, the, have some kind of control over you. Once you have asked forgiveness, you have repented, you've changed, you ask forgiveness, you've done what you need to do. Be responsible for all and only what you are responsible for. Do what you can do. If you cannot make that other person forgive you. So don't go carrying around that guilt or that anger. Let it go. You let it go. You have asked for forgiveness. You have done what you needed to do. You've taken care of what you can take care of. Let it go. Now, also though, place that person in the hands of God. Pray for that person. Pray that somehow, some way, God will speak to them, will work in them, so that they will accept your apology, that they will forgive you. But it's time for you, once you have made that confession and apology, it's time for you to let go and walk away. If they won't forgive you, then walk away. So, because on the other side of forgiveness, whether you receive it or whether you give it, the other side of forgiveness is freedom and joy. And let me tell you, it's worth it. There is no feeling like feeling guilt roll off your shoulders and not be feeling like you're responsible for carrying around this crap uh, uh, anymore, uh, that you need to hide anything, that you can really be honest uh, and that relationship is restored or at least you've done what you can to restore that relationship. Don't let somebody try to use, you know, uh, an unwillingness to forgive. Don't let somebody try to use that to manipulate you. You know, you have asked for forgiveness. Either they forgive you or they don't. If they don't forgive you, I can't forgive you at this time or I can never forgive you. Either way, walk away. Say, you know, well, if you feel like there's a time when you can and you will, come see me. Otherwise, that's it. Walk away from it. Easy for me to say, not so easy to do. Because sometimes these are people that are really close to you. But you can't let other people jerk you around. Let it go. Walk away. Now, some questions on this particular idea. Um, think of a simple, everyday slight that you've experienced maybe recently now, how did you handle it? Answer that to yourself. You know, or if you're with somebody, you know, tell them. How did you handle it? And how could you, should you, would you handle it differently now that you've been through this, this process of what we're looking at here regarding forgiveness? Would you handle it differently if you had a do-over? If you could hit a reset button and God said, okay, you get a do-over here. What would you do differently? And why would you do it differently? Think about that one. Another question. Um, for the, the slight that you thought of here, now that we we're talking about the first questions, apply the wrap process. Remember, assume, and pray. Remember your shortcomings. Remember your own shortcomings. Assume the best of the other person and pray for the person and how does that did that impact your thinking would that impact the way that you dealt with that person with that issue with that problem now answer these questions this is the last one in your own words you know with what we've finished now talking about how would you answer these questions is forgiving the same as condoning? Remember, we answered, we talked about that earlier. Now, based on what we've talked about now, would we, you know what we said in the beginning? We said forgiving is not the same as condoning. Do you agree now? Do you think that that is the case or not? A second question. Does forgiving dismiss consequences? Remember earlier we talked about how Forgiving does not necessarily dismiss consequences. In fact, it probably will not. Do you agree with that? And last, do you forgive a serious offense 
if the offender has not repented. Remember, we talked about that. So, if you are you going to forgive a serious offense if the offender has not repented? Okay. Now that wraps it up for today, and we're a little short, but that's okay. You don't mind that. But next week uh, we are going to look at an actual biblical example story of what we've been talking about. Uh, and if you want to read about it um, in advance, um, we're t going to be talking about <clears throat> a situation in the book of Gen Genesis um, where we have some real significant um, issues, a family issue. We're going to be talking about the story of Joseph, which appears in, uh, see, it's Genesis probably starts about Genesis chapter 48 and goes then to the end of Genesis. If you want to look at that, read that uh, a little bit in advance. We're going to be talking about Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coat. No, we're not going to be doing any of the singing. Donny Osmond will not be here. But um, we're going to be looking at that story as a story of uh, forgiveness, repentance, reconciliation, because we're talking about some real extreme examples there. And that will probably wrap us up then uh, for this particular study. Uh, so go forth, do good, right if you get work, send money if you do. Hope the Lord blesses you then real good.